بس يلي قاعدين ورا في كثير محلات على الكنبيات هون فاضيه فاذا بنحب نقرب على بعض نحب بعض نتواصل مع بعض ويا ريت ما نروح بليز تفضل اريد رائحه القهوه اريد خمسه دقائق اريد هدنتي لمده خمسه دقائق من اجل القهوه لم يعد لي من مطلب شخصي غير اعداد فنجان القهوه فبهذا الهوس حددت هدفي ومهمتي ثبت حواسي كلها في شيء واحد وشربت تنعطشي من اجل غايه واحده القهوه كلمات الشاعر الراحل محمود درويش في كتابه ذاكرة للنسيان. I grew up between the West and the East. And as someone who goes up in between these two areas, it's hard to find who you are and find your identity. On one side, I have an ancient lineage, traditions, music, food, and culture for my family. On the other side, I love hip hop, and I love Western movies. And sometimes it's hard to find your place in either of these boxes. And I grew up, as you mentioned, in California uh, in Brooklyn. And growing up in the, in the West, and especially in the US, it's often very hard to find your place. Um, my background actually was supposed to be in law. Uh, and at some point along my path, I think many young millennials, we get to a place where we feel lost. Uh, we don't know which path to take in life. Our parents usually have pretty specific paths for us. Doctor, engineer, lawyer. One of my uh, Pakistani friends, when he told his father he wanted to be an actor, his father said, Beta, he said, Dad, I want, to be, I want to be an actor. He said, Beta, it's pronounced doctor. <laughs> and so uh, I grew up in this, in this environment. And along this route, I found coffee by accident. Uh, it's a much longer story, but uh, sometimes in life, things come by chance, and you are drawn into a path that you didn't really think about. Uh, so six or seven years ago, I'll tell you a little secret. I didn't really drink that much coffee. Uh, I thought coffee was a very bitter thing, and you had to put loads of cream and sugar just to drink it, usually for studying for exams or driving late night. One day, I went into a coffee shop, and I had a cup of coffee that pretty much changed my life. Uh, it was a cup from Ethiopia, from an area called Jirgachefe, and it tasted like blueberries. It was very sweet. So I asked the barista, I, asked, I said, what did you put in this coffee? It doesn't taste normal. He said, I didn't put nothing in this coffee. This is how coffee is supposed to taste, when it's done right. I said, what do you mean when it's done right? He said, when you know the producer, we have a direct relationship with this producer in Ethiopia, and we're able to pay them a premium uh, for them to live a better life, and they produce delicious coffee for us. Uh, and so uh, at that point, I began to look into my family's history in coffee. And I did not know anything about my family's background in coffee. Uh, Yemen is a country that has many civilizations and a long history of uh, different types of, of empires and kingdoms. Some ruled by men, others ruled by women. You might have heard of uh, Malika Bilqis and Queen Arwa. Queen Arwa, by the way, ruled for 42 years in the 1300s. Uh, and in her time, Yemen was, it was kind of uh, Zaman al-Izdihar. It was known as a time of flourishing. And she had many trade routes throughout the world, particularly in India. Uh, and one of these interesting empires was an empire around coffee. Um, for those of you who don't know, there is a city in Yemen called Al-Makha, uh, which is now translated as Mocha. And it's the reason why we're all here today. It's really an incredible city that changed the world. My first uh, love for coffee was through history. 
I learned that the, the first people to drink coffee, and there's a big difference of opinion between two countries. One is Yemen and the other is Ethiopia, Habasha. And depending on which side of the Red Sea you live, you'll probably have a different answer. And I think I'm probably the only Yemeni that thinks coffee began as a plant in Ethiopia. I hope there are not too many Yemenis here. <laughs> um, but they didn't drink coffee. Their early consumption was they would take the coffee ch cherries um, and they would uh, wrap it with animal fat and eat it like that. Sort of an early keto diet. Shout out to any keto fans. Um, but the first people, أول من زرع القهوة قصدا وحصدها وحمصها وجهزها. You know, the first to, to take coffee and harvest it and to cultivate it and to roast it and to brew it were Yemenis, were Arab, particularly the Sufi tradition in Yemen. One man in particular, his name was uh, Sheikh Ali ibn Umar al-Shadhali, who was born in Tarim, a very well-known city for scholars in Yemen, but he had his school in al makha And he writes a book, a really incredible book. Uh, its title in Arabic is Inas al-Safwa bi Anfas al-Qahwa. Um, I hope you guys translate that correctly, but the people of Safwa, of self-purification uh, in the breaths of coffee. يقول فيها رحمه الله قهوة البني يا أهل الغرامي ساعدتني على طرد المنامي وعانتني بعون الله على طاعة الله والناس نيامي لا تلوموني على شربي لها إنها شراب أستاذ الكرامي And that it is, right? Uh, when I heard these, these lines, it really uh, affected me. The idea that coffee could be a very spiritual drink. Uh, and for them, it was a very serious drink that brought community together. After long days of work, people would come together at night and they would use coffee as a way to stay up to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to make these beautiful adhkar and nasheed. Uh, and from there, coffee begins to spread throughout Yemen. Uh, coffee, for those who don't know, it's an Arabic word. The, the, it's the Arabic word coffee, it means a type of wine. Uh, it also comes from the word qaha, that is satiates you, makes you not hungry. And when the Turkish people, the Ottoman Empire ruled uh, al makha they have a hard time pronouncing the Arabic letter wow. So we know wali becomes veli, qahwa becomes kahva, K A H V E. Then the Dutch who began doing trade in Yemen in the 1600s spelled it K O F F I E. And then eventually entered the English language as coffee in 1582, or coffee if you're from Brooklyn. <laughs> um, and it leaves Yemen, it goes from Yemen to, this is by the way my longest slide, so bear with me a little bit. I think it's, it's really important, if anything you, you come here, more than my own story, is to understand the story of coffee and how it's part of our identity as Arab, our culture. And it's very important for us to understand where we come from to learn where we're going in life. And that's why I'm spending a little bit of time on history. And so coffee spreads from Yemen, uh, Hijaz, to, to Saudi Arabia, to Mecca. And in Mecca, from there, it gets transferred to uh, all throughout the Muslim world, particularly to Egypt. Actually, there was a big fitna in the Muslim world. Many scholars thought that coffee was an alcoholic drink, was haram. So there was actually uh, fatwas against coffee in the beginning. You know, talk about having an elastic mind, right? Um, and so eventually coffee um, makes its way to Europe and um, if I can find my, my clicker here and a really magical thing happens um, when coffee leaves the mocha and goes to Europe people for the first time had a drink that brought people together um, before coffee the main drink in, in Europe was alcohol people were always drunk you might have heard the dark ages right and so when coffee drinks comes to, and these cafes open up in cities like Vienna and Paris and London, people have the first time something that stimulates their intellect, that builds community without class barrier. And in these coffee houses, a very magical thing happens. The Russian Revolution, American Revolution, French Revolution, there were coffee shops that were known for philosophers and writers and bankers, and they became things that really changed the world. So for me, I fell in love with the potential for coffee for us as humans. I always say that oil powers factories and machines, but coffee can power humans and dreams. Um, and 
eventually coffee makes its way throughout the Muslim world and moving fast forward to now. By the way, it's an incredible history. If you get a chance to understand the story of coffee and how it spread and what, what it did, it's really wonderful. Uh, and, but the reality now um, is that in Yemen, almost 60,000 tons of coffee were being shipped out of al makha And actually, the, the, the numbers now are, are sub-10,000 tons, a huge decline. So when I found out about coffee, I tried to learn why wasn't there any Yemen coffee available. Uh, in, in the Bay Area, there was this wonderful movement of specialty coffee that was really starting to spring about. So I went to Yemen around 2013 is when I first started and I switched gears. And that was very hard for my parents to understand. How was I supposed to go from a lawyer to a coffee farmer? My, fa my parents risked a lot to go to America. Uh, and many immigrants understand their stories and of a struggle, and so for me to go backwards, it was very difficult, and it took them a long time to understand, and I think in many ways they're still trying to figure that out. Um, but this is a picture of me in the province of al Hudaydah, in the western part of Yemen. If you look on top there, it's actually a village. Uh, this area is called Bura'ah. And these, هذا كلها مدرجات زراعية. These are all terraces that grow coffee. Um, this is me trying to look like a brown Indiana Jones. It's really hard for me to describe how special, unique, magnificent, wonderful, marvelous of a place Yemen is. Um, the images we see nowadays don't show these, these types of pictures. This is a village in the area of Haraz. Coffee here, some of the highest grown coffee in the world is grown here at over 2,500 meters above sea level. People here have, in this village have been living here for over 840 years old. Years. Yemen, we care a lot about our lineage. Um, and so people know this is how they lived for those so many years. And they live a very uninterrupted way of life. They haven't changed much. Um, you see on the sides of the mountains, they forced the mountains to grow their produce. They use these mountains as a way to kind of protect themselves, being high up from any uh, people trying to um, attack them. And this is a video I took. Uh, and so I went across 32 regions in Yemen, from Shimal Yemen, Sa'da, near the Saudi border, down to al Hajjah, Mahwi, Haraz, down to uh, Anis, Anis, Utma, then to the Madagosta, uh, Ib, and Irian, down to Ta'az, Bani Hamad, Wadi Balabil, down to Yafi. And everywhere in Yemen is very interesting. There's so much diversity in the, in the dialects, the, the food, the dress. But there's the same types of values that we share also here in Kuwait, I think, Al Karam you know, a leifa, when you have guests over. Just people who are so warm and so hospitable that whatever they give you just tastes better. Um, and so I went and I took samples from these different regions. Uh, for those who don't know, coffee is a very unique product. Um, there are different types of cultivars and varieties, just like in any produce. In apples, you have Granny Smith, green apples in Washington, and Fuji apples. In coffee, you have names like Katuai, Katora, Tipica, you know, a, a SL28 cultivar from Kenya might have more of a, a green apple taste, while a uh, Bourbon from Guatemala might be more chocolate. A Geisha from Panama might have more floral jasmine notes. And so, um, unfortunately, because of in the industrialization of coffee, uh, we don't know this. We're taught that coffee is a cheap drink that just tastes the same, but it's not. And so I took back samples from every region I went to, every village. Um, yeah, I wrote down things like harvest patterns and varieties and, you know, and, and these types of things, but I learned more the stories of the farmers. There are these villagers, we, we would go there and they would have people line up one person from each household. And I would ask them, like, what are they doing? And they say that they're, um, they're doing a lottery system to see who gets to host you because everybody wants to, be, wants to host you. And, and they would go out their way, they would get the loans to buy a, a, a haruf or buy a meat so they can be a, a generous host. And if you tried to give them money in any way, they would be extremely offended. You know, so when you see these types of people, you know that they, they have a, there's a heart in this and something that they produce that they're proud of. Um, and so I took these samples and I, we, uh, we call them cupin, which is our way of tasting and sensory analyzing coffee. And to become a certified taster, you have to learn, there's 22 exams. Uh, it's sort of like being a sommelier. One exam, I had to learn 36 smells for coffee. And I actually became the first Arab, Arab coffee, like Q grader or, or coffee taster in this regards. 
Um, and so we taste these coffees, and you go around, and you slurp very loud, aggressively. When I, when I first went to my first coffee tasting, it looked, you know, these people had like clipboards, and they had these little spit cups and sp spoons, and they would slurp it and spit, and it was very serious, and I thought it was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever seen. You know, and then like, and then at the end, they would talk about what they tasted. You know, and someone would say, I taste strawberries, or I taste like baby carrots. I'll never forget, someone looked into my eyes and said, this, this coffee, it's too passive aggressive for me. <laughs> and I looked at him, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I totally s I see what you're saying here. <laughs> In my head, I'm like, this tastes like coffee, you know? Uh, it's a longer story about the idea of learning sensory, but really, there's, it's such a vast thing to learn and how, to understand, how do you know taste and the olfactory gland and how we store memory, but anyways, from these samples I brought, these 21 samples, uh, 19 were horrible. They had all the worst defects you can think of. But two of them, they didn't just do okay, they scored a 90 plus rating, which is the highest you can give coffee. It's very rare. Um, and so I went back to Yemen to start working with these farmers. I learned that the way the coffee was picked and processed, there was no structure. Uh, it's not that the farmers were, were lazy. To pick cherries, by the way, these are coffee cherries. Coffee comes from the ground as a shrub. In, in the cherry, there are five layers, the skin, the sticky mucilage, the parchment, the silver skin, and then the seed. Coffee, believe it or not, is actually a tropical fruit. Um, and so we roast those seeds, and then we make this drink that will change your life. Uh, and so it starts off kind of green, and, and, and then becomes yellow, and under the middle of when it's fully ripe, it's this beautiful red color. And to selectively pick the red cherries, it's not easy. It takes much more labor. And so I, I remember seeing one of the farmers pick, you know, these different colors, and I asked her, I said, if I gave you more money, could you just pick these red ones for me? If, well, if you paid me more money, I will pick rainbow color cherries for you. <laughs> um, so there's a relation to what you pay and what you get. Uh, and so I like this picture because I realize most of the farmers have no idea how their coffee tastes like. It's pretty sad that many producers produce things that we consume, but it's processed and exported and roasted somewhere else, and they had no idea what their coffee tasted like, and I felt extremely sad, and so I went, I roasted them with some coffee, I gave them their coffee. It was theirs, an Indonesian, and an Ethiopian. And I didn't tell them the coffee was on the table. And so I asked them, um, which one do you guys like the most? All of them picked their coffee. So at the end, I lifted the cups, and I showed them the names, and they saw their name, and you see the look of, of, of pride in their, in their faces. Um, and uh, I did this work, this was 2014 to 2015, and, you know, Yemen, unfortunately, it was going through a very difficult time period that only intensified. There is a political reality to everything we consume, and sometimes it's, hard, it's easier not to think about where our things come from because we might feel a sort of guilt. But in the case of coffee, it's not just important. We have to be conscious consumers. And it's something I'll talk about more towards my end. Um, Yemen, you know, after the Arab Spring, uh, the government, the interim government that was in place was very weak. Different political parties were trying to rival for power. And for me to do this kind of project, you know, sometimes they say ignorance is bliss. Because had I known the, the, the difficulties of just running a business, let alone a business in a place like Yemen, I don't know if I would have been able to do this because sometimes you need to be very imaginative to realize and see yourself above things. Um, and so my life pretty much changed on um, March 25th, 2015. Up until this time, there were a lot of mm, things happened around me in Yemen that should have gave me warning to, to slow down or maybe think about a different route. But for me, I had this vision, and I saw these farmers, and I felt connected to this land. And I don't know, I felt for the first time in my life, I found something that gave me meaning and purpose. And so this is a picture I took outside the coffee mill in Sana'a, 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, and for me, uh, I don't know anything of war other than what I ex read about in books or saw in movies. But to experience war, to live war, to feel the earth shake, it's something I wish none of you have to ever experience. And if you have, and if you know people who have, you'll never know truly how frightening it is to have sort of um, an idea of, of, of certainty around death and to think about your life. You know, that night I found myself writing uh, letters to my parents, very sad letters, apologizing for not being a better son and 
you know, telling them goodbye because I wouldn't, I would, did not know if I would see them again. Um, and so, um, eventually, fast forward to April, I was supposed to leave to attend a coffee conference in Seattle. And so my whole project, my whole story was I was going to work with these farmers. Uh, we helped them, instead of um, drying coffee on the floor, we build raised drying beds. It was a very, it was sort of like a quality social intervention model. On the quality side, we gave them certain tools and certain te- protocols on producing better coffee. Um, building raised drying beds, giving them moisture meters to improve the way they dried evenly. And then on the social side, micro loans, gender equi- equality, and making sure they were paid a fair price for their coffee. Um, but th- before the conference attended, this war began, and, we were, and I found myself stuck. The airports bombed, and I didn't have much to do. I couldn't, I felt again stuck in life. And so um, I tried to leave from the south of Yemen, Aden. I went through a few very difficult points in my life there, being kidnapped twice by different groups. From there, I was able to leave through an incredible group of people who really saved my life. And in prison, I heard about the port of Mocha and that there were still shipments leaving from there to East Africa. And in my head, I said, well, if I ever left this place, I'll go to the port of Mocha and I'll leave from there, and, you know, and... Uh, three days later, I was in Sana'a. My parents were still you know, worried about my life, and I hadn't really processed all that I had gone through yet. So from there, I went to the Port of Mocha. I got there. I went to the Sheikh al I went to his actual maqam. is still there, and I met the, the, muf- the mufti and the judge of Mecha. But then eventually, I made it to the port, and we took this small fishing boat across the Red Sea to Djibouti with my coffee samples. Um, and from there, I made it to uh, California. The coffees I brought were some of the most, they, they consider them one of the best coffees in the world that actually won the number one coffee in the world in 2017. And they charged $16 for a cup of my coffee in the US. Uh, um, uh, for, for me, what was more important was that the, the, and these tests were blind tests. They had no idea where the coffee came from. I didn't want them to look at the story or where the coffee came from. I wanted them to respect the work of these farmers and what they put into the, the, the product and how they produce this in these certain situa- situations. And we were able to expand around the world to different places. And, um, and for me, I wanted to end with this picture because the images that we see of Yemen are very difficult images. Uh, Yemen is going through the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. 80% of the population is, is, is uh, malnourished. And yet, with this, with this condition, they're able to produce these incredible, incredible coffees, some of the best in the world. When I see a group of a pe- a refugee camp, I look and I see uh, human potential. You know, for me, when I, when I took that boat ride, I, I felt, what are Syrian refugees who leave Syria or people from East Africa and Eritrea or Libya, what makes someone leave land to go into the ocean? You know, people, unfortunately, are living in these horrible con- conditions. But th- that with all this that's happening, it doesn't mean that we should be hopeless. Um, I think that if millions of people do small things every day, then true change can happen. And for us, for you here, some of your homework is, or things to do when you leave, when you buy a cup of coffee, ask your barista where this coffee comes from. Who produced it? How are they treated? If we just paid a little bit more attention to how we consume our products, our clothes, our electronics, we can save and help so many people around the world. The idea that when we decide to go cheap on things, there's, there's fast fashion, there's fast food, there's also fast coffee. Someone pays a consequence to that. You also get a pretty crappy coffee. Um, and so for me, I wanted to leave some time for some questions in this, but I, I wanted to end by um, thanking everyone here for attending, for allowing me to speak. I feel like I'm speaking today on behalf of the farmers in Yemen and people in Yemen, and I don't get the opportunity to speak in front of my people. Most of my talks are in the West, which is fine, but I think that, you know, we should, as, as Arab, as people from the region, we have a, a responsibility to be the leading forces in changing the world. We were once, and we can do that again, inshallah. Thank you. Mukhtar, thank you so much. I think everyone joins me here in saying that you humbled us today. So thank you. Excellent. We start with a Q&A. I will try to leave room for people who didn't ask before, but you can have the last question. One question. 
questions up there on the top, please. Thank you. Oh, she has a little exercise. السلام عليكم. <تصفيق> ممكن نتكلم بالعربي؟ ايه تفضل. اوكي. آه عبد الكريم الشطي انا كاتب في ادب رحله ومن فتره قررت اني اتطفل على القهوه واكتب عن ادب القهوه. وللاسف وجدت نفسي في زخم كبير صار لي اكثر من اربع سنوات. آه رحت اليمن، اثيوبيا، كل مكان وبديت احاول اتعقب القهوه. وما يؤسفني وما يخجلني ان هذا المشروب العربي المعتق اللي كان له دور ضخم في العالم العربي وبالمناسبه تحيه خاصه لارواح هؤلاء الناس اللي 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 عملوا بجهد بجهد على طبخ القهوه بهذا الشكل الشيخ العيدروس صاحب عدن او الشيخ القريشي صاحب المخة او الشيخ الذبحاني كل هؤلاء الاسماء اللامعه اليوم يتم طمسهم بشكل مبرمج بسبب ان اليمن في حاله نزول واثيوبيا في حاله صعود لذلك نجد ان ان ال الاثيوبيين الان قادرين على اعاده طرح التاريخ من جديد وتصوير القهوه على انها مشروب اثيوبي ابتداء وهذا الوضع يعني ما توجد اي ادله تاريخيه تثبتها والاثيوبيين يحاولون بشتى الطرق في احياء بعض الاساطير القديمه اللي ما لها اي قيمه لاقناع العالم بان القهوه طبخت ابتداء من اثيوبيا علما بانها مشروب عربي عريق جدا ويجب يعني اليوم احنا في عالمنا العربي نعاني من من قدرتنا على تسويق ثقافتنا وحضارتنا واعتقد ان القهوه هي مدخل ممتاز لتسويق هذه الحضاره ومع ذلك نجد ان اليوم كل ما يتم في في عالم القهوه هو عباره عن تطبيق حق الواين اندستري كل المعايير اللي كانت مطبقه هناك بدات تطبق على القهوه وهذا شيء خاطئ اليوم اليوم القهوه حتى حتى ذوق القهوه قاعد ياتي من شعب لا يستطيع ان يتذوق القهوه وهم الامريكان الامريكان اول ما بدوا يشربون القهوه كانوا يحطون الفلتر مال القهوه من جلد السمك فكانوا يشربونها زفره بس هم كان اللي يهمهم ان تكون كميه القهوه كبيره لانهم يهتمون بالحجم اضعاف اهتمامهم بالطعم لذلك احنا اليوم نجني على القهوه جنايه ضخمه لما نتركها بيد الامريكان يحاولون يسوقونها ويحاولون يقدمونها حق البشر القهوه على ايد الامريكان لما ما قدروا يشربونها بداوا يخترعون شيء يسمونه انستنت كوفي قاموا يضيفون بعض بعض النباتات الاخرى زهره الهندبه وغيرها من من النباتات يحطونها على القهوه عشان يعطونها الطعم الطيني الطعم الارضي اللي يسمونها هم ايش يسمونها بالانجليزي يسمونها ايرثي تيست وهو من اسوء انواع القهوه يعدم طعم القهوه عشان يشربها لكن بما انهم اليوم يملكون الماركات والبراندنج والتسويق ومحلاتهم موجوده في كل مكان اصبحوا يصبغون علينا طعم قهوه سيء بس المهم الحجم يكون كبير جدا لذلك اعتقد دورنا كعرب ودورك انت كشخص انا كنت اتمنى اشوفك اليوم بالزي اليمني الوطني صراحه استقت لما شفتك بالزي الغربي كنت اتمنى انكم فعلا تسوقون حق القهوة كمشروب عربي لأن هذا أملنا الوحيد أن احنا نسوق ثقافتنا العربية من جديد من خلال هذا المشروب. أو سؤال بس آخر سؤال بس أنا حابب دافع عن مختار لأن مختار مش بلبسه بعمله نحن مش بلبسه لا لا كان راح يكون أجمل إذا جمعنا اللبس مع العمل لا لا والله أشكر لك على حبك الشديد للقهوة وشغفك في القهوة ونحتاج من الفرق أكثر بيكتبون هذه الاسامي الذبحاني والقرش المفروض كلهم يعرفوا هذا من هؤلاء الاشخاص لانهم هم الذين بداوا في في تصدير ثقافه القهوه فانا كما ذكرت في بدايه محاضرتي انا لي لي هويتين هويه عربي وافتخر في هويتي العربي وهذا من هويتي كانسان عايش في امريكا واحب اللبس هذا فهذا لا يختلف لا بالك ان شاء الله لا ليس في تناقض ان شاء الله الحمد لله اخر سؤال بس فوق في عندنا كوفي بريك فيك تحكي معه. يس بليز. شكرا على هذا البرزنتيشن الرائع. آه كنت بس بسال هل سجل سجل ملف القهوه في الانتانجبل هيريتج مال اليونسكو؟ للاسف كلمه موكا ليست لها حفاظ في اليونسكو وغير اليونسكو وهذا من ضمن الاشياء اللي نحاول نشتغل فيها. وفي الان بشتغل مع معهد جوزيف البن كافي كوازي انستتيوت. وفي احد البرامج تبع الوكاله الامريكيه التنميه الدوليه من ضمن الحفاظ عن كلمه موكا المخا فاذا استطعنا ان نحفظ هذه الكلمه نبدا من هذا الشيء لانه اكثر الامريكان عندما كما ذكرت ذي دونت لايك ما يهتموش في السياسه لكن عندما تدخل من جانب ثقافي وشيء مثل القهوه الكل يحب القهوه في امريكا 
ثاني شراب تشرب بعد الماء. So I, I think it's very important in English to, to go through and express our culture through our food. It's much more relatable than politics. And we're trying to actually um, trademark the name Mocha for Yemen. Start with that first. Because uh, not just the, the name itself, but the practice. Because I, uh, from what I understand, the intangible heritage uh, decree uh, is a way, uh, once you register the practice of uh, uh, cultivating uh, coffee, uh, this will impact uh, uh, with the farmers of the coffee uh, of coffee in in Yemen, so that's why I was um, I was curious to know if there's a file uh, the, of uh, for the coffee practice in Yemen. There is, and there's there's some precedence to this. The government of Colombia they also did this because before they would put Colombian coffee and it would maybe be five percent. So the government of Colombia actually went to court and they protected the name Colum uh, Colombian coffee. The Ethiopian government also did, just like in France for champagne and champagne, just like halloumi cheese in Cyprus. They all went through this, pro this project, this program, and so these are some of the things that we want to work on, hopefully find people who are interested in, in funding these kind of initiatives because they cost money to go through the legal route. But it is important. Thank you very We have a coffee break. We can talk about Mokhtar outside, so that the program is present. Next question, Kermelik. Ah, Yemeni. No, that's right. نرحب فيك مختار بالكويت وبس كنت في ملاحظة يعني كثير من الجمهور ما يعرفوها إن في اليمن مش لأن اليمنيين ما ما يقدروا القهوة بس لأن اليمنيين يشربون القشر اللي هو قشر القهوة هذا هو المشروب اليومي فيمكن لذلك يعني ما ما لا تقييم عند الناس. فإلى أن نرجع نعطي للقهوة معناه يعني يحتاج كثير من الأمور في كثير معوقات ليش القهوة ما ما لها هذا الحضور من جزء منه إن نبات القات هو حل محل زراعة القهوة إلى أن البن كان دائما يصدر للخارج وما يستفيد منه أهل البلد كان ودي تتكلم عن الفاونديشن موكا فاونديشن وكيف ممكن أن عملية تصدير البن يعني كل المراحل الإنتاج تقام في اليمن عشان يستفاد منها اقتصاديا أكثر من أن فقط أن احنا نسعى لتصديره وهو بعد خام شكرا شكرا في كان وقتي محدود جدا هذه المحاضرة غالب أشياء ساعة لربع أو ساعة but the goal is to make it more social entrepreneurship. It's more of a social entrepreneurship. So, as I said, it's right. In Yemen, at least 15% of the people who drink coffee. The coffee is the goal in Yemen. The coffee is the goal. And this is a lot of food. It's actually a super food. It has more antioxidants than cranberries. It's a very... In a few years, it's probably going to be famous outside of Yemen. And then, one of our biggest challenges is Shajat al-Qat. Al-Qat al-an, akhtar min 3.5% min miyah al-Yemen, tuhruh ila al-Qat. Wa fi ba'dha al-manatak al-shamali, 50% min miyah al-Yemen, tuhruh ila al-Qat. Wusla al-marhala ila darajat inna san'a, yani tahat khatar, bitkun awal medina, tuhruh adam fiha al-ma'a. So one of our main objectives is to switch from coffee, from Qat to coffee. You know, we've been able, this year we planted 30,000 coffee trees and took out 30,000 Qat trees. Uh, and these are initiatives that we are doing on our own, but we, I have a separate foundation, Liam Asasa, Asasa al Makha, and Hadaf al Asasa, Yani, uh, uh, al Qtsad al Yemeni, and Tariq al Qahwa. And this is what happened in Qabl, in Rwanda, after the Harb al Ahri al Tahan that happened in Rwanda, the Hakuma Rekazat Fimajal al Qahwa. And Spahad al Qahwa here, he had a lot of Fakir al Qtsad, Rwanda, Ilal An. So, inshallah, I think that if we focus on coffee as an alternative to Qat, it can help with the refugee crisis by creating jobs. It can help with the water issue by, by, by having a plant that takes less water than Qat. It can help with um, um, creating stability in this conflict country where young people who don't have jobs are the ones that are targeted by these radical groups. You know, that's, that's the reality. So creating jobs, and most importantly, the idea of exporting, when I sell our coffee in London, in Tokyo, in Paris, they learn about Arab, they learn about Yemen, 
through a drink, other than what they see on the news and media, which is, unfortunately is not always a positive thing. Uh, and so I'm a big believer in, in food as a catalyst for change and, and building bridges. And I think that, you know, I'm one person, we need many more people to do this work uh, in Yemen, in coffee, in other industries, not just in coffee. Um, but I, I really appreciate you. So if anyone wants to know more about our work, you can go on this foundation work, uh, www.mochafoundation.com. And if you want to support more of our work, um, you guys are very lucky because you have an incredible roaster, Richard's Coffee, Al Hajar Rahan. Please raise your hand. For me, yes, I'm happy I sell my coffee in other, you know, in America and in Europe, but it was, it was a huge uh, point of pride that I, our best coffee lots went to Jarrah last year, one of our best ones. From, we, had a, we had an auction, and you won one of our lots. Uh, and so for me, it's important to support businesses like Jarrah who are trying to build these relationships and trying to help, um, and really we're lucky to partner with someone like him who can showcase our coffee in such a beautiful way with the wonderful people of Kuwait. Shukran. Thank you so much, Mr. Shukran. Thank you.